Hi guys, welcome to this video, which is based on the core practical investigating pH, where in particular you'll be investigating the change in pH on adding powdered calcium hydroxide or calcium oxide to a fixed volume of dilute hydrochloric acid. To carry out this experiment then, you'll need a few things. You'll need a pipette, a glass rod for stirring, some tweezers, a white tile, a beaker, and some universal indicator paper. You'll also need a measuring cylinder, some hydrochloric acid, and some calcium oxide or hydroxide. Okay, to carry out this investigation, first of all, use a measuring cylinder to measure out 50 centimeters cubed of hydrochloric acid. Put it into your beaker. Then, take some of that acid and put it onto your pH paper on your white tile. Leave it for 30 seconds, and then figure out the pH. Once you've done that, use a weighing boat to measure out 0.3 grams of your calcium oxide. As soon as that's been measured out, you're going to add it to your hydrochloric acid. Once the calcium oxide has been added, stir it to make sure it's fully reacted. Now you need to repeat step two. So take a sample of your solution, add it to your pH paper, leave it for 30 seconds, and record the pH. The final step is to repeat this until you've collected enough data that you can actually see a trend. Now, once you've collected all that data, your next thing to do is to take it and plot it into a graph so you can actually show the trend produced. Now, when you plot the graph, it's important to make sure you get the axes right. So on the bottom axes, you put the independent variable, which is the thing that you changed. In this case, the mass of calcium oxide we added. On the y-axis, that is the thing that you measured, which in this case was the pH, and that's called the dependent variable make sure you label it and add your units. Your next step is to plot your data. So when I had a mass of zero grams, I had a pH of one. So I can put a cross in there. At 0.3 grams, I also had a pH of one. So I go to 0.3, read up to one, put a cross in, do the same with 0.6, the same with 0.9, the same with 1.2, and then the same with 1.5. When I got to 1.8, it goes up to 4, so I go up to here and put my cross in. 2.1 went up to 7, where it was neutral, so I can put a cross in here. 2.4 went up to 9, so I can put a cross in up here. And then finally, 2.7 went up to 10, so I can put a cross in there. All that's left now is to put my line of best fit in, which in this case is a curved line of best fit. So because it's flat down at the bottom, I can just use a ruler to join this up. But then the second I get to here, it starts to curve. So I'm going to draw a nice curved line of best fit to go through all the points. Okay, let's recap on everything that we've gone through then. So your first step is to use a measuring cylinder to add a certain amount of hydrochloric acid to a beaker. It doesn't matter what that volume is as long as you keep it the same. Estimate and record the pH of the contents of the beaker. You did that by putting some pH paper on the white tile, adding a drop to the acid and leaving it for 30 seconds. Once you've done that, measure out a certain amount of calcium hydroxide, the smaller the amount the better. Put it onto a weighing boat and then repeat. So Add that to the beaker, stir it, and then check the pH again using the same as step two. Once you've done that, repeat these six or seven times, keep recording the pH, and then plot it onto a graph which will show you the link between pH and the amount of calcium hydroxide added to the hydrochloric acid. Okay, we've got a couple of questions then to have a go at. There are eight in total. The first two are name the soluble salt formed when hydrochloric acid reacts with calcium hydroxide. Write the balanced equation, including state symbols, for the reaction between calcium hydroxide and hydrochloric acid. Now, to do question two, you will need to be able to balance equations and write them from scratch. Check the skills section on my website, and that will tell you how to do that. Pause the video, have a go at the two now, and we'll see how you've done in a minute. 
Okay, so let's have a look at question one. It says, name the soluble salt formed when hydrochloric acid reacts with calcium hydroxide. Think back to it, you take the name of the metal, which is calcium, and hydrochloric acid forms a chloride, so you get calcium chloride, which gets you one mark. Question two, write the balanced equation, including state symbols for the reaction. I've put the states, the ions here, Ca2 plus OH minus, H plus, and Cl minus. So when calcium and hydroxide are together, you have 2 plus here, 1 minus there, therefore you have CaOH2. Hydrochloric acid you should remember, but if you didn't, you've got H plus Cl minus, so it's just HCl. Calcium chloride, Ca2 plus, Cl minus, you need two chlorines to balance out the calcium, so it goes to CaCl2. And every time you see a hydroxide, think water as your byproduct. So you'll get one mark for the CaOH2 and HCl, and then one mark for the CaCl2 and H2O. Your final mark will be for balancing, and the way to look at that is you've got two hydrogens there and one there. We need to make that even, so let's double it. Then I've got two chlorines, which is balanced. Four hydrogens in total over here, two there, so put a two in front of that, and we're balanced overall. Again, if you need more help with that, go to the skills section on my website, have a look at the balancing equations for neutralization reactions. Let's move on to questions three and four then. So question three says, look at the hazard symbols below and give two reasons why hazard symbols are used on chemical containers. So have a think back to when we did the actual hazard symbols and what they mean and why it's important to have them. Question four, which is a three marker, says explain why it is more hazardous to handle calcium oxide than calcium hydroxide. Again, use the state symbols to help you. Pause the video, have a go, we'll see how you've done shortly. Okay, let's go through questions three and four then. So question three says, look at the hazard symbols below, which I've put down in the corner down here, and give two reasons why they should be used on chemical containers. So there are two things that I thought of that we can put here. The first one being, they show how dangerous a chemical is, so they show you what the warning signs. And then number two, they tell you how to handle the chemicals and what precautions you need to take, whether it should be safety goggles or whether it should be a mask or gloves and so on. Question four, explain why it is more hazardous to handle calcium oxide than calcium hydroxide. For that, you need to know what the state symbols mean. So first things first, calcium oxide is corrosive. That's what this symbol down here means. And then this one means harmful. So calcium hydroxide is harmful. Corrosive means it destroys materials. And then the last mark is harmful means that it can cause reddening or blistering. Right, let's move on to questions five and six. Question five, give two reasons that eye protection must be worn when using dilute hydrochloric acid. And then question six, a student investigates the change in pH when calcium hydroxide is added to 100 centimeters cubed of hydrochloric acid. A, state two controlled variables in this experiment. Those are the things that you kept the same. B, state the independent variable in the experiment. That's what you changed. And then C, describe how the student could modify the experiment to investigate the temperature changes instead of pH changes. Pause the video, have a go, we'll see how you've done shortly. Right, let's go through the questions then. So question five, give two reasons eye protection must be worn. Nice and simply the first one, avoid it splashing in your eye. And then the other one, which might have been harder to think of, is you might put your hand down on the table, might be a chemical there, you might not know. If you rub your eyes, then you could get that chemical in your eye. So it's to stop you from rubbing your eye with your hands, which might have the acid on it. Question six, state the two controlled variables in the experiment. The volume of the acid, 100 centimeters cubed every time. Also the type or concentration of the acid, it must be for example 0.1 molar or it must be hydrochloric acid. The surface area of the calcium hydroxide using a powder instead of a lump and then the time the pH paper is left before the pH is recorded. So if you leave it for 30 seconds, it might look different if you've just put it on. Part B, state the independent variable in this experiment. That is the thing that you kept the same. It's only worth one mark, apologies for that there. One mark and that is the mass of calcium hydroxide added. Part C, Describe how the student could modify the experiment to investigate temperature changes instead of pH changes. That is nice and simply, use a thermometer or a temperature probe to check the temperature after every 0.5 grams is added. 
On to question seven then, the penultimate question, which says, a student wants to find the mass of calcium oxide powder that produces a neutral solution when added to 75 centimetres cubed of hydrochloric acid. She adds 0.5 gram portions of the powder to the acid and measures the pH with a pH probe. The results are on the right. Predict the mass of the calcium oxide that produces a neutral solution. So use the information in the table on the right to do that. And then state and explain how the student could improve her experiment to obtain a more accurate result. Pause the video, have a think of how you'd answer those, have a go at them, and we'll see how you've done in a minute. Okay, let's have a look through then. So 7a, predict the mass of calcium oxide that produces a neutral solution. If you have a look at the table over on the right here, you can see 1 gram gives you 2.8, 1.5 gram gives you 12.3, so it's going to be in between the two. Approximately halfway, so I've gone with 1.25. And you'd have got a mark for anything in between 1.2 and 1.3 grams. State and explain how the student could improve her experiment to obtain a more accurate result. So you'll notice there, there's quite a big change between 1 gram and 1.5, so you could actually improve and go every 0.1 grams. So use smaller masses each time, or go up in 0.1 grams each time, that would be a way to get one of the marks. You could also say why, because that will give you more pH values to be able to calculate the mass used a lot more accurately. And then you could also repeat results, take an average, making sure that it's concordant, so making sure the results are, are more accurate. And then finally, you could also plot the results on the graph and extrapolate the data to find out exactly where it would be. Right, let's go to the final question, which is the pH of a solution may be determined using universal indicator paper or a pH meter. A, state why a pH meter must be calibrated using a solution with a known pH value for one mark, and B, explain whether indicator paper or a pH meter has the highest resolution, which is worth three marks. Have a go at both, pause the video, and we'll see how you've done in a minute. For the final time then, let's go through the answers. So state why the pH meter must be calibrated. Nice and simply, if it's not calibrated, you cannot tell the pH. So without calibration, there's no way to determine the pH of the solution you are measuring. B, explain whether indicator, paper, or pH meter has the highest resolution. What you're looking for there is accuracy. So your pH meter is gonna have the higher resolution. And the reason for that is that is accurate to one decimal place whereas your indicator paper is accurate to zero decimal places. Therefore, the pH meter is 10 times more accurate than the indicator paper, meaning the pH meter has a higher resolution. That brings this video to an end. Hopefully it's been useful. Use it when preparing for the exam. Hi guys, hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, click on subscribe down below. And you can also find out more information on my website, mrbarnstc.com, and Facebook and Twitter.